Bonjour tout le monde. Guten Tag. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Ciao à tutti. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Kalimera. Kinaiden. Sveik visim. Hello Europe. Bonne dimineața. Hello everybody. Good morning. Bonjour Strasbourg. I'm really happy to be here because this day is an amazing day for us. There are even voices in the political debate uh, saying that Polish democracy is, uh, is at stake once again. So we hope that our membership uh, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the European Union and our presence here will secure our safety and freedom. I we come from a city that is right on the border with Germany. We can see our differences very clearly. However, the EU isn't about our differences. It is more so about working together to get a better future. And I hope that even though we are from a <laughs> small town that is fairly insignificant compared to all of you, that you will hear our voice and give us the opportunity to tell, tell you our opinions and what we think of the EU. Thank you. We're not gathered here today just to represent our countries. We're here to present the Europe of tomorrow. I feel very honored to be here today with all these young people that care about politics and democracy. We are the future European citizens. I'm aware that we're going through times of great Euroscepticism. Many of your countries might face difficulties, such as my own country, Greece, which has to face uh, economic and migration problems. However, I strongly believe in the power of people when they are united, because one country alone might go faster, but all our countries together, as a European Union, will go further. <laughs> Rade moj, vječno ćeš tako mlad Ostati u srcu mom I came to politics from journalism. I'm in the European Parliament since 2004. So I work on the agriculture and rural development issues, on environment, food safety, public health. But I worked a lot on Brexit, and I'm sure a lot of uh, those gathered will understand that Brexit Day is looming on the 31st of January. The United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. We had a very tough debate yesterday here about that. A very sad day, many of the UK colleagues you know, very emotional because many want to stay, but of course the UK is leaving. And I suppose there's a question from me to the young people um, who are listening about whether Europe matters to you, whether the idea of so many people from different countries coming together, you know, arguing, agreeing and disagreeing, but essentially listening to each other and working together, whether that's still important. So even though that the regulations for discrimination of market on market were made stricter, whether the EU's future plans on increasing the fines, given that the ones that are uh, given right now are not near, nearly the amount of money that the companies make by selling the same product with lower quality but with higher price in different parts of the EU. This issue of a product in one market being different than another, but the price perhaps sometimes being higher, so one of lower quality but higher price, has been debated in the Parliament and raised many, many times. It's unacceptable. And it's part of um, what we need to take a deeper look at, which is again, back to my point around the food supply chain, which there is so much that's not transparent about it. Um, there are many things that we need to understand between the producer and the consumer. And I think that the fact that the issue has been raised by you in this chamber, but by colleagues of yours and other member states who are not at all happy about this, um, means that action will be taken. Now, the one thing I've learned, and this is one of the difficulties about Europe, we move very slowly. And that's sometimes very frustrating. And I think you, in asking your question, will probably say, well, why aren't you doing something now? We demand action now. And the reason is we have to consult and negotiate and discuss. And I would ask for your patience on this, but also your pressure. Because 
you know, you've said this to me now, so I'm going to take this back and, and talk to other colleagues to say, look, this remains an issue, we need to do more. But even in the member state, you know, there needs to be a consumer association, a lobby that pressurizes the companies and the politicians to say that this is not acceptable and it has to change because companies listen to customers. And indeed, if these products weren't being bought, if people decided, look, we're not happy with this and we're not happy to be getting a lesser product and being charged, that has also an immediate impact. So I would ask you to bear with us on this. Um, I just was reminded coming in here that, you know, roaming charges have been, you know, taken away and lots of you can roam in Europe and you're probably doing it now without those extra heavy costs. But it took a long, long time to get that in place, but it was worth the fight. And one of the things we're trying to do now, and I'd love to hear your feedback, is this isn't a lead for a, a phone, but there are many, many cables and different fittings for phones, for iPads, for all sorts of electronic gadgets. I have a drawer at home, it's full of these things. We are trying to say to the manufacturers, agree on one common standard so that we have one cable that fits all. It's not impossible. We've started the process. It may take some time for it to come to fruition, but it will happen. And I think with your pressure and your support, these things can happen quicker. You talk about how terrible is the UK is living from Euro. Uh, my, my short question is, uh, what we have to count on and uh, what we we'll have to stay uh, in things and what will be changing. Thank you very much. When I say how, how terrible it, the UK is leaving, I'm just sad about it because of our being together for such a long period of time. And I think it's sad not just from our side, the European Union side, but also from the UK side. As you know, I'm from Ireland, so we live close uh, and, and we're, we're, we're good neighbours and our relationship has improved enormously over time. I think your question, if I heard well, and correct me if I'm wrong, is what does Europe need to do to change, to maybe address some of the concerns which led to Brexit happening? Um, and on that, I think we have to listen to what people are saying. And we're, we're going to have, uh, and it will kick off in early May, a conference where we listen to communities. We go out and listen to, no more than I'm listening to your voice now, that we, we, we talk to different groups and try and see what their concerns are. And I think maybe what we have failed to do, and you know, as I said, we don't always get things right, but what we failed to do is to get a deep understanding that Europe, uh, the European Union rather, is not just about trading with one another and financial transactions, the cold economy, if you like. But it's about a Europe that was shaped from the horrors that I mentioned earlier, where people did unimaginable things to, to each other. And it was just an awful period in time. And where had we not intervened and had those countries at the beginning of the European Union said, let's stop this, let's work together, let's build something where we talk rather than fight then I think we wouldn't be living um, in the relative calm that we live today, even though there are many problems. What I would like and how I would like Europe to change is to also ask people to bear responsibility. So you as a young person, instead of people thinking it's all down to the politicians to do, to change, is to say, well, actually, I have a vested interest in peace, in stability, in my country being strong, but part of the European Union. I see no conflict in strong nations, yet working together at the EU level. But we also need to listen, and perhaps to people who say, but it's too bureaucratic. Um, because it is. I mean, you know, sometimes you think, why can't we just do this? And then I realise, well, we can't because there are rules, there are regulations. Um, and perhaps one of the ways that I can help in that, coming from a journalism background, is very often, and I, 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 I perhaps say this to you who engage on social media, when you read something that is very clear in a one line, you should say, but what's the real story? What's behind that headline? And when I was a journalist, when people would say, you know, or somebody would, a politician would say, give me a line, I would always say, but there's something else going on behind what you are saying, and I need to find that out so that I can speak to the truth of the entirety of an issue. So perhaps Europe wasn't listening when the United Kingdom was saying, look, we're gonna have a referendum because David Cameron, the prime minister, came to us at the worst possible time. The migration crisis was at its height and people were, if you like, caught for time and emotion and space to deal with the UK problem. So I think that what we all need to do is to say, yes, Europe needs to change, but fundamentally, if you strip it all back, what is Europe about? 
It's simply about countries that come together voluntarily around a table in different institutional formats to talk and listen, regulate, make law, you know, change for the better, understand that you come from a different nation, but I respect you and you can listen to me. If you think that has value, intrinsic value in itself, then Europe is worth not only protecting and defending, but building. And I think the challenge for us is how can we do that better? So that people don't think of Europe as being cold, as Brussels based. Um, because, you know, I'm elected by the people in my constituency and I have to put my face out there. I have to say, please vote for me. Um, and if I don't um, all, all the time go back and talk to people and listen to them, I won't get re-elected. And I'm glad that I have been re-elected on a number of occasions. But it does mean that people who feel passionate about, um, about peace and stability and working together, we have to work twice as hard. And I think you have to help us, even if you disagree with parts of Europe. Fundamentally, if you value what you have today, I don't know how many member states are there, but it's fantastic that so many are and that you have the chance to engage. Do you think it would be better if you weren't sitting together in that chamber, that you didn't hear from each other, that you just kept to yourselves? I don't think that would work. I think you have a lot to offer. When people come together, we, we can do great things. If we fail to work together, bad things can and do happen. My name is Elian, I'm from Sweden. And in 2019, we'd had a bit of problems with China trying to threaten us, literally, and uh, trying to, you know, silence our free speech. And um, it's theorized that it's a kind of test to see how much they can influence a smaller country. And I'm wondering if the EU has any sort of plans or preparement for this sort of thing, because we need to do, go all together if we want to have the power enough to do something about such a big country. Yet yeah, the world is, in a strange way, fragmenting, but powers are getting stronger. If you look at China, and you've referenced it there, they have been more engaged in Africa. And I've just been saying that we need to do more in Africa to have an influence, uh, rather than China setting the agenda. We see the US, where the president has different views about Europe, and, and in fact is not quite pro-European. Um, but I think your final comment perhaps seals it for me, is that if we are to be effective um, in the European Union, we cannot allow that one member state tackles that huge challenge on its own. I think our difficulty has been that um, not only for the time it takes for us to agree, but to get everyone onto the same page, if you like, to say that we need to do something uh, in relation to uh, having one voice on global issues. Uh, we had a seminar yesterday after the Brexit debate on artificial intelligence, which is moving so fast that you probably cope better than I because you're much younger. But this will impact not only your lives, but your professions and democracy itself. Um, and, you know, there are consequences if we allow technologies to be kept uh, in one large country and influencing the rest of the world. And, you know, honestly, I don't have all the answers, but I know the problem you raise around the, the Swedish concerns. How do, does Europe use its weight of numbers of its sophisticated democracy to make sure that we don't become irrelevant in a world which is becoming more complex and more difficult and more divided? And I suppose not to be pessimistic, um, you know, there are terrible conflicts raging around the world. Uh, there are big players engaged in them. There is geopolitics working at a level which, you know, was never seen before, if you like, since the bad old days. And the president of the commission, van der Leyen, has said very clearly she wants a geopolitical uh, commission. So I think that answers your question, that Europe is aware that we need to work better together on these issues. producing more and consuming less. There are companies already doing this, and um, EU and other big countries, for example, United States or China, could invest in them, and they would also get their benefits back um, from the company, and it would be a longer-term investment. At first, it would cost more, but then it would pay back greatly, not only in a sense of money, but also in a sense of efficiency. Fourth point would be um, minimalist packaging in the stores, um, replacing plastic bottles with glass bottles, 
and just not using as much plastic where it is not needed. For example, while packaging the fruit, you can just take the fruit home and wash them. You don't need all of that plastic. And the fifth and a very important point would be educating the people on climate change, not only the young generation, this is the case where I think younger generation don't need as much education as the older generation because in mainstream media there isn't much information about the climate crisis that we are facing. So we could introduce this through practicality, give some practical lessons, show how it's done and make this concept understandable to all generations so that we can all work together to face this climate change and stop it as quickly as possible so that our children and grandchildren have a planet to live on. Thank you. The first point that we have proposed is an amendment on the seventh article of uh, the European Treaty, which clarifies how to suspend certain rights from a member state of the EU. And uh, currently, if we were to sanction a country, we need all other 70, uh, 27 members uh, to agree, uh, which is a major issue and a change is needed. So the proposition that we had made is amend uh, this article so that not all member states have to agree uh, whether uh, to suspend um, a state, uh, but two thirds, which is 18 states. And the second point was um, on some uh, modern issue, which was data protection, because most of our lives are related to the internet right now. And uh, however, a lot of people don't even read what they're giving consent for, uh, like for example, um, regarding the terms of service of um, some sites. Um, so our group proposes that we educate uh, everyone who is using the internet to um, <clears throat> protect uh, their data uh, more cautiously and uh, we, that we have to provide people with specific educations on what happens with their data and uh, that information is needed um, to be provided by uh, every site. And um, another point was protecting the freedom of speech and if uh, freedom of speech has um, <clears throat> has to be protected even when um, civil security is at stake. There are serious mental and physical threats to our health with drugs and alcohol. We need people to know this. There are ri risks such as lung, lung issues, liver issues, as well as many others. These are terrible issues that can result in later life illnesses, ailments that can be almost crippling. And we need to really be aware of what we are doing with ourselves and how we take care of our bodies. The group had a unanimous, a pretty, a near unanimous decision on, on all aspects of our discussion today. And we now move on to, can you get addicted from one or occasional use, drug use? Now, we would like to emphasize that this is in case of circumstances, the type of drug you've taken, as well as the person you are. Why? Because it depends on you how your body is, and the drug, whether it's soft or hard drug. And it also depends on why you are taking it. We need to outline, like I've said before, what this means. If it is a drug such as heroin, that is known to be highly addictive. Whereas if it is a drug to, like cannabis, which we considered in our group to be a soft drug, it is not as addi addictive. So therefore, that will be key, a key factor in deciding whether you get addicted straight away and are down, going down a, in a, a slippery slope of near impossible return without on your own. Again, you have your own addictive nature and it's different with everyone. And this is also key in this discussion because we also need to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves. First of all, education should be, should be one of the, union, of the European Union's main priority. Schools, school curriculums need to be updated and standardized within the European Union, as well as teacher training. Wages 
should also be less low for countries where the legislation is not that constraining. Erasmus program should be expanded to an international and intercontinental scale in order to spread Europe's values throughout the world. It would also include uh, exchanges started from, starting from primary school. In order to give uh, the, European, the European Union institu institutions more visibility and transparency, we should set a new subject at school that would help individuals to be more aware and have a better consciousness about what it means to be European. Each year, tons of food is wasted as it isn't in compliance with the standards set. We should therefore change those standards and waste less. We urge societies and corporations to redistribute the food instead of throwing. We could implement laws or incentives for those corporations. Moreover, uh, in the context of an unstable world, the European Union should lean toward the idea of a European army to defend itself and reinforce its power throughout the world. It is also meant uh, to be independent from the help of NATO and the US. Thank you for your attention. So the first point is a multi... Uh Okay, so it would it should be multinational co cooperating. Basically, uh, one country cannot stand alone against uh, this big of a crisis. For example, Italy or Croatia. We joined the European Union for a reason, right? So uh, we are hoping that um, there is a way we can cooperate with other countries to solve this problem. The second point we discussed uh, is the differentiation of the intentions because uh, you cannot believe someone's word for their word. We need to know who are these people, why are they coming here, and uh, we believe that with the modern technology today we can do that, and it shouldn't be really hard. Uh, and the last one is education and integration. Uh, not just educating the migrants on where they can go uh, find a job, where they can uh, be successful, but educating the Europeans on who are the migrants and why are they coming here, what are their intentions. So basically our point of view is that every problem has a solution and uh, we can start solving them, giving the migrants a push to a better future and a better Europe. Luckily, the EU has recognized it as uh, its big problem and therefore invests a lot of money into uh, fixing it through the uh, Youth Guarantee Initiative. Uh, it is basically a project which offers a job, uh, a job or an apprenticeship uh, to every young European who is under 25 and has been unemployed for uh, at least four months. Uh, it's genuinely a great idea, but it has a few key problems. Uh, first problem is uh, that many aren't aware of the existence of the program, uh, both the employees and the employers. So um, we can't really take part in something if we don't know uh, that it exists. And the second, uh, even greater problem is that uh, sometimes uh, young people don't accept the jobs they're offered through this project. Maybe because uh, they consider themselves to be overqualified for the position, or maybe because they're simply not interested in the offered job. And that results uh, in them uh, remaining unemployed and their positions remaining uh, uh, untaken. Uh, therefore, uh, we have on one hand side uh, 300,000 unemployed young economists and on the other we have serious lack of employees in certain professions. Uh, we believe that would be different if uh, the youth was properly educated on the labor market. <laughs> Thank you.